I know for sure that there are some folks in here that are learning this for the very first time, right? And I also know for sure that some of you have seen this before, right? So, you know, I'm going to try to hit a balance here, and we're going to go through, again, some of the, some of the basic fundamentals of why this is important to a gas utility, because I think if you can understand why, you know, then you can also understand the cost that's incurred, you know, and then how, how this solution actually, you know, helps the utility uh, become more uh, efficient with their operations, right, and improve the overall safety of, of the asset. So how many, do we have any first time REACH attendees in the room? All right, all right, cool. All right, good, well, welcome. You know as well as I know that if, if you want to get a gas utility to do something, you know, regulate it, right? I mean, because that's the, that's the master that you guys serve. And the, the uh, cathodic protection, you know, at least in the U.S., and I'm sure Canada has a very similar thing, um, but the Electronic Code of Federal Regulations deals with transpor transporting hazardous materials Right, and then, you know, as you get down into it, it gets into FEMSA and pipeline safety, and then it gets into some very specific requirements for corrosion control. And um, so, so let's, let's take a minute and think about that. So, so you have to do it, and the, the, the government regulates it, and therefore there's an audit process that goes along with it. And what's interesting about it is, I think, the, I think these, these regulators, they want something to happen, but they're almost apologetic about it because they only make you do it once a year, right? You just go get a read once a year, and if you miss it, you got, you know, three months to kind of catch it up as long as you, you know, get back in line, you know, by the next year. And they do that because they know this is a manual, the labor intensity, it's all manual, you know, and it's, um, it just takes time, right? And in order to get these reads and to, to comply with these, these mandates, you have to be specially certified, right, to, to do it. So it's, um, it's kind of a, it's an expensive proposition that you get into, right? But, but it is mandated. I like Bill Nye. You know, I've always been kind of a, a science-y kind of guy. Uh, he would take some of these complex concepts, right, and kind of break, break it down for you, right? And if, if, if Brad were here, you know, Brad might actually appreciate this, you know, because we're going we're gonna keep to it, keep it simple. But uh, so that, uh, that green and red thing over there on the right, who knows what that is? It is a water molecule, that's right. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about water, even though this is a gas session. <laughs> All right, so, so this is the water molecule here, H2O, right? And it, it turns out that even in this cup, as it sits here, it's not just H2O molecules, right? It's constantly dissociating, right, between anions and and cations, and, and that becomes that becomes really really important, right? They just the electron just passes back and forth between the two water molecules constantly, and then there's a complicated, you know, chemical equation, which that's the last time we're going to talk about that. But it represents you know what that little animation is doing over there. But the bottom line is this: so. Water is necessary for corrosion to occur. Okay, so you know, think back to the days where either you or your kids, right, maybe you had a, a steel swing set in the backyard or at your grandparents' house or something, and it's, it's sitting on the ground and how the legs of it corrode, right? If, if, water, if that swing set were sitting in the arid desert, it would not corrode. Right, but if it's sitting in wet, damp soil, it will. So why is that? Well, the corrosion is about electrons, okay? It's about electrons, so when, when this thing right here, when this one that stays positive, it's looking for an electron, right? And so uh, uh, a steel, 
or a, an iron pipe is always trying to donate an electron to the ground and if that water is sitting there with a positive receptor it's going to take the electron okay so this is just sort of some of the fundamental building blocks of, of cathodic protection uh, and it's, it's like this you think well I, electrons are pretty small right what's what's the impact right well every electron has a it has a mass right and even though it's small it's kind of easy to think about it like a, like an elephant you know in the in the in the Sahara or something right like if there were a bunch of ants eating this elephant away you come back in a week the elephants pretty much still intact but you come back in a year elephants gone right so it's just little by little by little right these forces they just they never stop they're always at work and they're always at work on your pipeline and leaky gas pipelines are not a good thing let me talk before we get into some of the details here let's talk about what is cathodic protection right so cathodic protection is where we put a surplus of electrons on a, on a pipe so that when that water anion or cation is looking for an electron, it's not taking an electron from the pipe, right? It's taking an electron from the surplus of electrons on the pipe. So electrons have a, a negative charge so if I get a bunch of electrons on a pipe and I take a voltage reading of that pipe, it's going to appear to be more negative than it normally would be with, without the electrons on it. So the guys on your teams that are going out with voltmeters to the field and you know taking voltage me measurements, they're making sure that the pipe is negatively charged enough so that it has a surplus of electrons on it so that if when the water is in the in the ground you know the the surplus is used and the pipe does not corrode right so that is essentially the essence of cathodic protection right surplus of electrons there are two ways to get that extra negative charge on the pipe uh, one is called uh, galvanic protection uh, if i take a, a block of aluminum or magnesium and I connect it through a copper cable to a steel pipeline, electrons are going to flow from the aluminum onto the pipe, and it's going to cause the pipe to be more negatively charged. Right? Another way to do it is through a rectifier. I can take uh, power from the AC grid. I can rectify it into DC voltage and then impress a DC current on the pipe. Right? So that, that's impressed current and galvanic are the two ways to get a surplus of electrons on the pipe. You guys have heard a whole lot about SPAN this week, right? Um, and five years ago, right, uh, the, SPAN, the SPAN committee actually came to me, a, a small group of stakeholders, and they said, we've got this FlexNet network, and we think there's more bandwidth there than what we're using to collect meter reads, right? Can you guys do some stuff that would help us, right? Sure. You know, what, what would you like for us to, to do, right? And so they came up with two things, uh, pressure monitoring and cathodic protection, right? So we're here to talk about cathodic protection. So this, this idea actually came from, from you guys, right? That, that we could use FlexNet to, to build a solution, you know, to help with cathodic uh, protection and, and what we essentially do, um, you may not recognize these from this picture, but if you've seen them, you know, out in, in the world, they're yellow posts. And once you know what they look like, they're everywhere. You know, and so, so I have a, a sort of a, a similar phenomenon. When, but before I started working at Census, I never, ever thought about a meter of any kind, right? And I never thought about a smart pointer or an ERT, ever, right? But once I started working at Census, I can't go to a grocery store without looking at the, you know, what kind of meter they got, 
<laughs> you know, and, and do they have any telemetry on it, right? Well, it's the same with this, right? Once you become aware of it, you see these yellow posts everywhere, right? So what we've done is we've essentially built a, um, a voltmeter that sits in that post, and we're going to talk about that in some detail. But you know, for, for now, it, it's like the, the, the components of this solution you, you program these devices. We have we have a, a piece of hardware for the rectifier, which we monitor, and one for the, the test point, which we take the voltage reading off the pipe. You program these things with the exact same software and, and handheld devices that you currently program the smart points with, right? Same stuff. Uh, two devices uh, go into the rectifier and the test point. Same FlexNet base station that you're using to read meters. Um, same r and uh, And the only thing that's different is there is an app, a CenturyPoint app, that sits on top of the r &I database. It shares the data with the r &I database, right? And it's, it's separated from the r &I because the, the folks that need this data are a very specific, specific group of people. Right, the people in pipeline integrity, and more specifically, like the supervisors who are responsible for, you know, uh, cathodic protection in particular areas, they're the ones that need the data. So we've separated it out from the RNI. Right, people who nor do normal RNI operations will not care about this. Right, so it's separate, has separate logins and things like that. All right, so. Um, I'm going to hit these bullets uh, because each one is up there for a very specific reason. Um, so, so this solution collects and displays data daily. Now, in, in the world that FEMSA had envisioned, right, it's one read per year, right? And in, in this world, it's, you know, six reads per day. Right, it's a lot more frequency of reading, right? And the first thing that a utility thinks about when you start talking about this to an engineering uh, group who, who, you, who is considering using it is they think, I'm overwhelmed with the amount of data. What in the world am I gonna do with all this data? Um, and if I have all this data and I have a, a breach, and I don't do something about it, and my regulator finds out that I had all the data and I didn't take any action on it, I could really, really get in trouble. You know, I, I think ignorance is bliss, and I really don't want this much data, right? We, we've heard that before, right? But then the, uh, the cooler heads prevail, right? And they say, well, no, we, we, we want the data because when we have the data, we can see the trends, right? You, you can literally see... You know, seasonal trends, you can see trends of, of you know, wet seasons, dry seasons, you know, you, you can just see things that are going on that, that could explain, you know, why you're seeing things that or, or ordinarily you wouldn't know why you're seeing that or why things are behaving that way. So, so collecting and displaying data and trending is extremely valuable, right? It, uh, it, it allows you, for example, if you're... Um, if your anode bed is becoming depleted and you can look over time and you can see the voltage you know, line is changing you know, for the worse, you can look out a year or two and say, oh, I need to budget for anode bed replacement, right? It's not you show up one, one year and you've got a read that's, that's off or you know, non-compliant you can see it coming, right? And so you can be very proactive and very predictive with your budgeting and your maintenance, among many, many other things. Um, there, are, there are different NACE criteria. You know, you've got, uh, you've got the ohm, what they call the protected or the ohm voltage reading. You've got the instant off voltage reading, and you've got the 100 millivolt uh, difference or criteria three reading, and so this solution supports all three of those. Um, the, the batteries in the test point, um, the batteries in the test point 
and the radios are the same exact batteries and radios that are in the smart points, okay? And, you know, those batteries are guaranteed to last for 20 years. The, uh, the demands on the test point are actually less than the demands on a smart point, so it's a 20-year it's a battery. Right, in, in the test point. Uh, but what we do is every hour, this, this device wakes up and takes a voltage reading. And it's not necessarily taking that voltage reading to send it in, you know, and be archived in the system. What it's looking for is an alarm. Did something happen in the field within the last hour? Did a backhoe cut through, a, you know, a copper, a copper line or... You know, did, did something, you know, interesting happen? And it could be so many things. Uh, people can chain an aluminum door to a meter that's cathodically protected. Well, then all of a sudden your cathodic protection system is protecting the whole building, the voltage drops, right? So, so you know these things when they happen. Uh, we've seen real-world examples in other utilities where a contractor was hired to come in and do some maintenance on an above ground valve and when they put the valve back into place they didn't put the uh, insulators in and therefore all of a sudden two different pipe sections are tied together and the voltage just dropped like crazy because it was protecting you know 10 miles of pipe instead of five miles of pipe right so so you just you just pick these things up uh, very quickly um, you can mirror the roles and the permissions because if, um, what's a good example? Um, you know, if I'm in the east and I'm responsible for some, some activities in the east of my, of my service territory, I don't need to see what's going on in the west. Likewise, the guys in the west don't need to see what's going on the, in the east, right? So we can, we can separate these things out. The, uh, the building block of the solution is pipe section, okay? If you think about, you know, a, a, a local distribution company and their, and their pipeline where, where things come in from the, from the city gate, you essentially have just, it's like a circuit, right? It's just a big circuit. But we end up uh, separating these pipes with insulators, so each one is like an electrically isolated section of pipe. And that's good because that way we're managing uh, individual pieces, right? Now, not all utilities do that, right? Well, I've seen some cases where, uh, and Tom, I think it's you guys, <laughs> right? <laughs> where uh, every single pipe is just like a big loop, right? So the whole thing is just like one pipe section. But typically these things are segregated and into electrically isolated um, pipe sections, and that becomes the building block, right? When we talk about importing historical data, a lot of times that, that system is defined somewhere else. You have, you have a pipe section. It has a name. There are test points already associated with that pipe section. There are rectifiers associated with that pipe section, right? That's data. That's metadata that you already have. And then sometimes pipe sections are grouped into service zones. And then service zones are grouped into districts, right? And then districts are grouped into company divisions and then, you know, ultimately the corporation, right? So there's a, there's a hierarchy. And if that hierarchy is expressed or can be expressed in a CMS file format, you can import that into this solution Right, so that you don't have to go in and create all the data yourself, right? You can import that. Likewise, you can export. Um, you, most likely, you have a, a solution, uh, a system of record that the auditors take a look at. Uh, it's been our experience that the utility that, that has CenturyPoint, they really don't want their auditors to know they have this kind of capability because the auditors are used to looking at one read per year. Show me the read, you know, and they start very basically and very vaguely and they say, what reads did you miss? You know, what are your missing reads, right? Well, imagine, imagine a solution that's reporting every hour or hourly data uh, four times a day. If you're not hearing from it, 
you know you're not hearing from it, right? If you, if you know that the, that the anniversary date for the test point is coming up in three months and you're not hearing from that test point, you can schedule maintenance on that test point, right? And you can you you will not miss data anymore when a regulator or an auditor shows up, right? You just won't. It's going to change the paradigm. So the auditor is going to get suspicious. He's going to say, "Tell me what you missed. We didn't miss anything." Ha! Huh, that's the first time. How did that happen, right? So you know it, it's going to change that. But uh, in the solution, for each test point, you can assign it an anniversary date, right? And that particular day's read gets exported out into whatever your system of record is, right? That way you can keep the auditors looking at the things that they're familiar with looking at, right, as opposed to taking them into, into this solution. Each test point is going to be classified. Okay, it's either going to be a, a, an own read, right, meaning I want, the, I want the read with the cathodic protection on, I want to know that it is more negative than negative 850 millivolts, right, that is what they call criteria one, and that is an own voltage reading, right. Now, if the solution is protected by a rectifier, you know, the, the theory is, number one, corrosion never sleeps, it never stops, it's always present, right? But the power grid is not always present, right? Things happen, power goes out. So if, um, if I lose my AC power to the rectifier, I'm losing my protective current to the pipe underneath it, okay? So what I want to know is, is my pipe polarized? Does it have a, a negative polarized charge on it? So that is criteria two. They will turn the rectifier off or somehow interrupt the current flow to the pipe. They call that an instant off. And then they will take a voltage reading of the pipe, which is essentially the polarized value. And so as long as that is more negative than negative 850 millivolts, you have a compliant read, okay? So that's criteria two. Criteria three is there are uh, there are situations there are um, like uh, take a casing. You know, you guys know what a casing is. All right. So if I'm running a gas pipeline under a, a street, right, or a railroad track, right, I put a um, a steel sleeve around it to protect the gas pipeline, right, and then there's some kind of insulator you know, that holds the pipeline off of the, the steel sleeve, right? But that sleeve is called a casing. What I want to make sure is, is that somehow my pipe doesn't get bent or get leaned down or cantilevered over and touch the steel casing. Because if that happens, I have a short between the protected pipe and the casing. And so my voltage reading is going to be affected. I'm going to get a non-compliant read. So, yeah, criteria three essentially takes a voltage reading of the casing, a voltage reading of the pipe, and if the difference between the two is more than 100 millivolts, we know that it's not shorted together because if it were shorted together, the difference would be zero, right? They would be at the same pipe potential, right? So that's sort of the, the third case, right? Those are the three criteria. And so each test point gets defined, right? So, so when, we, when we set these test points up in the solution, we, we tell it, um, what's your anniversary date? You know, when, when do you need to report your, your compliant read for auditing? We tell it, uh, what do you consider high voltage and low voltage to be? Because we will alarm you if the voltage falls outside of a, a certain range. Um, we tell it it's asset ID, and we, we tell it what kind of criteria it is expected to comply to, okay? So, so those things get defined in the beginning at the setup of, of the device. Alarms are raised by the device itself, okay? They're called, we consider these hard alarms, right? We don't want the head, for things that are, are important like a compliant read, those things are set in the device itself. Now there are some other soft alarms, I 
can't remember off, offhand what they would be. The, the, the application will take care of some, right? Like, like for example, here's one. If I, have a, um, if I have a device that doesn't have an anniversary date defined, the app will tell me, you know, here's a condition you need to be aware of, right? You don't have an anniversary read on this device. You should, you should create one. But that's, that's more of a, an alert and not necessarily like a, an alarm, right, if we want to mix the words. But anything that deals with the compliant reading is, is done by the device itself. Just to kind of break down a little bit on, uh, you know, what the, the elemental pieces here. And if you, any of you guys are interested, uh, I mean, we, we have this software that we can display in the booth, right, if, if you want to see it and actually see it interactively work, right, we, we can do this. These are just screen grabs of it right here. But, uh, you know, this would be sort of the... The, the landing page, right, just the default landing page. And, and what we have this thing set up to show here is the donut up there is you know, how, many, how many devices am I managing and what type are they, right? Uh, the, the window or the widget on the right is of all my pipe sections, which one have alarms on them, right? Uh, the, the next one is did I miss any anniversary dates, right? Like if an, if an auditor were to come in and wanted to see a, a, a read on an anniversary date, did I miss any? You know, this one here is which one is missing the anniversary rules, right? So, so you'd want the system to be able to export that. Um, if you haven't heard from a device in 48 hours or 72 hours, it can show up here. And, you know, so anyway, the, the, the dashboard kind of gives you the, you know, the high level stuff. And then you can kind of click into it, um, into the device details, right, as, as you, like, for example, if I had a pipe section out of range and I wanted to know what is the alarm, right, I would go into the device details and it would show me, you know, the alarm. And, and in fact, that example over there, that jagged line shows a, a whole bunch of AC interference on the pipe. Right, that's, that's what that's showing us. So, so the CP app registers all the devices. You know, you can set or modify the alerts. Um, enable security through permissions, right? So if I've got the guy in the east and I don't want him to be troubled with things going on in the west and vice versa, right? Those things get set in the, in the application. We create pipe sections, we edit pipe sections, we add devices to pipe sections, we remove devices from pipe sections. You know, we have graphical displays to analyze data and then if, you know, just things that we're missing, right? So that's, that's the essence of the app. The test point itself, uh, it's a voltmeter. It sits down inside a three inch uh, test station riser. 20 year battery life, fully warranted. It's uh, class one, div two, intrinsically safe. Uh, every hour it wakes up and looks for alarms. If one is detected, it gets transmitted immediately, right? So you don't have to wait for it. Uh, four transmissions per day. Oh, it's GPS synchronized. So, so I don't, anybody in here really familiar with cathodic protection? Yeah, you are, right? right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so this instant off test, right? This instant off test is a, a really cool thing. So remember when we talked about pipe sections, right? We group everything by pipe section. So I have to interrupt the current from the rectifier to the pipe. So the way a utility might do that today is they would set an interrupter in the rectifier on a pipe section and have its current start interrupting on a cycle. Okay, so there's some work done at the rectifier. Then I take my voltmeter and I go to each pipe section, uh, each test station along the pipe taking the instant off read, okay? Then when I'm done with all that, I go back to the rectifier, I take the interrupter out, close everything up, and, and I'm done for the day, right? All right, well, what, what the Century Point solution does, and because of the GPS synchronization, everything on the pipe section receives a command that says, hey, rectifier, at 0800 hours tomorrow, you're gonna go off. And all you test points on the pipe section at 0800 and a half a second, 
you're all going to take a voltage read, right? So it, the rectifier goes off, and then all the test points take the instant off reading simultaneously, synced by GPS time, right? So you know your read is, is time synchronized and good. Now, we actually do it like three times, right? We don't just do it once. We do it three times to make sure the averages and everything kind of kind of line up. But what used to take all day, essentially, to get an interrupted reading off of a single pipe section can happen in the background, you know, just by scheduling it, you know, like it can be pre-scheduled, like, you know, for once a year or once a month or once a week, you know, however you really want to do it, right? But it, it just goes on in the background now. Okay, so another key component is the rectifier monitor. Um, so this, this device, this device is actually sitting on its side here inside the rectifier. Right? That's, that, that's what it is, right? Um, and this is, this is fairly common, right? American Innovations has been a, a player in rectifier monitoring and interruption for decades. Right, and so rather than us try to build one of these ourselves, we partnered with American Innovations. Um, they uh, they were very willing to to partner with us, and we were very happy to partner with them. Um, it, it worked out in that num number one, our our sort of business goals and values aligned, which was the most important thing. But then, from a technology point of view. You know, that RM4150 that they have, it, it has a, a socket. You know, they, they currently, in their solution, they either have a satellite or a GSM radio inside it, right? So they gave us a common feature and said, if you can put a FlexNet radio in this socket size, you know, that's pretty much the integration, right? So, so that's, how we, uh, that's how we ended up partnering with them is their hardware allowed it and our corporate values uh, matched. And, and we know, you know, other people have pref preferred uh, rectifier monitors, but they also have proprietary hardware. You know, getting a FlexNet radio integrated is just a, it's, it's just a, it, it's a whole hardware redesign that we just don't have to go through. Um, but, but monitoring the rectifier is, uh, whereas the test points have to be uh, checked once a year, the rectifier has to be checked once every two months, right? So this is this thing gets compliant uh, compliant data off of it too, right? Your CP groups and your pipeline integrity groups have to also make measurements on these things. So right, the the solution captures that. Um, any questions about about that piece at all? Right. Any thoughts or further questions on Century Point? All right. Good. Thank you.